and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, politics-pros.com. Before we get started today, I'd like, you, I'd like to ask you all to please silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. While we've lifted the mask mandate here in the store, you are encouraged to wear a mask throughout the event and we can provide one for you if you did not bring one. But when we get to the time for opening the floor to your questions, we've placed the standing microphone at the end of the aisle to your right, right there. Please line up at this mic so that everyone can hear your question as we want that question to be heard in our recording of the event. We are audio, video, and video recording this event as well as live streaming so that you or anyone you know can find it at the Politics and Pros YouTube channel. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing here up at this table. So if, you, if you've not already purchased the book, we have many copies behind the register at the front of the store. We will ask you to line up starting at the pillar where the microphone is. And we will come by to ask your name for personalization, so please have your books ready for us. Once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy to help us out. So now, without further ado, tonight I'm very excited to welcome Kevin Griffin in celebration of his book, The Greatest Song, Spark Creativity, Ignite Your Career, and Transform Your Life. This creative nonfiction follows the imagined creative journey of Jake Stark, a hit songwriter from Nashville music publisher Mega Music, until he's not. When Mega Music decides not to renew his contract over a lack of hit songs, Jake is at a loss. His creative energy is down and the bills are piling up. Enter Sir Daniel Smith. Daniels, the young enigmatic owner of the hottest music publisher in Nashville, The Row. Sir Daniel introduces Jake to his unique approach to work and life, The Method. By following The Method's five distinct practices, Jake may finally be able to write the song he's always known has been within him, but just out of reach, The Greatest Song. From acclaimed songwriter Kevin Griffin, The Greatest Song is a book for every profession. Through the inspiring fictional narrative of Jake Stark, Griffin shares ideas that can be used by anyone, anywhere, to transform their career and their life. Kevin Griffin is an award-winning singer, sorry, songwriter, producer, and performer whose songs have sold in excess of 80 million copies and have been streamed over a billion times. He is best known. <laughs> he is best known as the singer and founding member of the platinum selling, platinum selling rock band Better Than Ezra. He has written numerous number ones and had songs performed by artists such as Taylor Swift, Train, Sugarland, Dierks Bentley, Christina Perry, Hunter Hayes, James Blunt, and many more. Griffin lectures internationally on, crea on creativity to groups and companies ranging from Live Nation, Google, Spotify, and Disney to Nike, YPO, slash WPO, and Salesforce. Please welcome Kevin Griffin. Give it up for Olivia. Great work, Olivia. Though I gotta, I gotta take a little issue with the asking people here to fold up chairs. <laughs> You're asking a lot. Masks and folding up chairs. And people are gonna say, can I get a discount on the book? <laughs> Since you're asking me to work. Um, that was awesome. Um, it's so good to be here at Politics and Prose. Um, I don't know if you're like me. I know Politics and Prose. I've, I've come here uh, for years. Um, so it's, it's an honor to be here. This is one of the cool bookstores. There's cool bookstores around the country. Um, I've had a really good day today here in Washington, D.C. A, a guy I went to high school with, is uh, he's, a, he's a congressman, and he took me into the Lincoln Room at the, uh, at the Capitol and the, in this like hidden doorway where the British came in to burn the Capitol, and, I, and then I got to go on the roof of the Library of Congress. Um, that maybe sign a waiver, you know, because there's no railing and stuff. And then we're with Secret Service people right before we go out the door and like, do they know we're coming out? Because uh, like at the Capitol and stuff, there's people, sharpshooters are always, I guess, 24 seven. So I was, I've got my, I'm, I'm knee deep in, the, uh, in Washington, DC. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, like uh, Olivia so eloquently said, I need to, I need to trim the, uh, the bio, that was a lot. <laughs> It was a little self-aggrandizing. Um, so uh, why don't I start? A lot of these I do um, with a, with a uh, moderator, but I, this is just me. You got me tonight. Um, why don't I start, though, with, with uh, kind of like the, uh, the inspiration. 
the germ of, of this book. It's, uh, it kind of goes back to this. I'll go over here. It kind of goes back to a quote by uh, Picasso. Pablo. I would call him Pablo if I was rolling with him in the 50s. I'd, in Barcelona, I would use the uh, lisp. Barcelona. I've been to Ibiza. Um, I actually have been to Ibiza. It was pretty great. <laughs> sober. I was sober in Ibiza. How lame. Uh, there's a Pablo Picasso quote that, it, that goes, uh, you probably heard it, that we're all born artists. But the challenge is how do we stay artists as we get older? And I use that, it, it's at the beginning of the book. And, um, or put another way, how do we grow into our creativity as opposed to out of it? And that's really kind of been my, uh, my quest in life. How do, how do I keep getting uh, more creative and uh, more inspired and more nimble and successful you know, as I get older? Um, and I don't think that Picasso was saying that we're all going to be uh, Damien Hurst or, 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 uh, or Keith Haring or Basquiat or Jackson Pollock doing a drip painting, you know, at a, in a Hampton studio while drinking some scotch while a beautiful or handsome muse prods us on in the corner, though. Sounds pretty great. What I think that Picasso meant it was that all of us, whether a musician, a baker, a plumber, uh, a realtor, you name it, all of us bring creativity to our daily tasks because everything we do, we're creating something. You create a business plan, I create a song. You know, and creating something demands creativity. And if you can agree, like I do, with that, that basic conceit, that basic idea, then it's not, a, it's not a stretch to say what can help one person stay inspired, creative, um, informed can also help another person. Uh, I've been doing uh, I've been doing music for 30 plus years, uh, which is crazy. For the longest time, I was so used to being the young person, the upstart, in the room. You know, like who is he? He's too young to be good. And now I'm the veteran. <laughs> As I've gotten older, my sneak my tennis shoes have gotten uh, sillier. So I told myself I would not be the guy in the songwriting session with the silly shoes, but here I am. Um, but I've been doing this for about 30 years, and, and over the past, you know, six or seven years, I, I've been working with, uh, I, I worked as kind of as a rule, I've worked with a lot of younger artists, you know, um, helping them write songs, helping them kind of craft what they do. And uh, I'm getting, I've been getting asked more and more, you know, how, did you, how have you stayed successful in a business that's notoriously um, fickle and youth oriented? How, how have you managed to, how can you write songs? you know, with these bands and, and write something that's relevant, bring something to them that they're gonna be excited about. So I had to kind of ask myself, huh, what do I do? What is it that I've done? Um, or what is it that I've had to do? And around about the same time, six or seven years ago, that I started kind of just started noticing while I'm getting asked this a lot, a friend of mine uh, I ran into uh, down in New Orleans, and they say, they say that nothing good happens in a bar after 2 a.m. Definitely in a bar in New Orleans during Mardi Gras, uh, but I beg to differ because on this this one chance uh, meeting, it was on. I had ridden in the Hermes Parade in New Orleans. Um, are you guys familiar with the, the 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 parades down in New Orleans? Yes, no, yes. So all the parades are named after uh, Greek or Roman gods, and the big parades right before Fat Tuesday. Um, are Hermes, Bacchus, and Demian, and I had just ridden in the Hermes Parade on a Friday night. I was a little bit peckish. Maybe I'd been overserved a little bit, uh, but, I found, but I rolled in to F&M Patio Bar. It's right on Chapatulas, right on the river. It's a very famous place. It's run by a, just a, it's like a typical New Orleans character named Trevor Palmer, and he talks like this, man. My Trevor Palmer, man, this shit is crazy tonight, man. You gotta get in here. But anyways, they're known not only for just being a crazy place to drink and, and dance on, on pool tables, they have incredible jambalaya. And they have great cheese fries as well. But I was there for the jambalaya, and I ran into a friend of mine named Brady Wood. And he, Brady uh, was there with a big group of guys. And you can tell uh, he's, from, he's from Highland Park, Dallas. It's the very ritzy part of Dallas. And you can tell Highland Park dudes because they're all very clean cut and they wear jeans with their t-shirts tucked in. Um, go to Highland Park and you see what I mean. <laughs> but they're all there. And they're with, with their wives. I'm like, what are you guys doing in town? And, and, and they had scheduled an educational trip uh, with their YPO group. YPO is this 
international organization of entrepreneurs, uh, men and women, and, and you have to have some kind, some some kind of like yearly receipts of twenty million net. Uh, receipts and so many employees to be vetted to be part of this group, and it's a great networking tool for these for um, for people of high net value, of which I'm not really. Uh, <laughs> but after this book, it's all going to change. <laughs> um, no, I've done okay, uh, pretty good. Uh, but uh, he, he said they were in town uh, to celebrate Mardi Gras, but also they had, uh, it was an educational trip, and they'd hired Malcolm Gladwell to speak for them. Malcolm Gladwell, tipping point, outliers, you know, he's no slouch. And he had spoken to him that night, and, and we're talking, and I'm waiting for my jambalaya order, and, and he goes, would you ever want to speak to our YPO group in our North, uh, North Dallas chapter? And I was like, my answer to most things in life, without thinking about it, is yes. <laughs> then, I live in the world of yes, then I think about, okay, how, how can I make this happen? How realistic is it? Um, so I said yes. Uh, and got my jambalaya and said goodbye to everybody and ate it and, and, and slept very happily. Several months later, um, I got a call from from Brady and he was like, "Hey man, it's three weeks till the speech. You know, here's here's your your flight information, your hotel. We can't wait." And I was like, "Oh my God, I've got to talk about something." And these are, these aren't slouches. I mean, I was like, I can't BS these people. I can't bullshit people. Um, these are men and women who are, you know, one person had sold SkinCeuticals. One was the the founder, Jeff Sinelli of Witch Witch. You guys know Witch Witch sandwiches. I was like, I need to really talk about something real. And in my head, I was like, wow, you know, I've been thinking lately about the things that I've done that I do to stay successful. And and as I thought about it and kind of started riffing, spitballing, if you will. Um, I realized that wow, there are kind of different tools uh, that I use uh, um, that I've learned just by reading. I'm just a voracious reader. I'm always searching on, what, on um, what's the next act. I don't believe in a second act, uh, just a second act, or a third act. I believe in a fourth and a fifth and a sixth act, and I'm, I'm always searching. So that's what I spoke about. I, I t talked about five different things I do, and it was it was couched in a. Uh, I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, couched in, you know, the, the, a story arc of my career, you know, of Better Than Ezra's career, and I played, you know, good, and then different songs I've written for other people. Um, and then in that, I talk about these tools, and at the end of the speech, we talk, we, uh, we write a song together. Maybe we'll do that tonight. Um, but it was a success, and it was, it was a blast, and then I did it for a few more y other YPOs, because they, they all talk amongst themselves, and some WPOs, that's that's the organization you you age out of YPO. I'm, I'm letting you know all about YPO. <laughs> and uh, but then it tur that turned into Witch Witch because the guy the founder of Witch Witch was there. Then then Live Nation, then Google, then Nike, then Disney, then Salesforce, and so I started doing all these speeches. And it was really great, um, and it was really easy because I get get up and talk. I play a few songs, and I'm done, and I make more than any better than Ezra show. <laughs> so I can. So about four years ago, um, uh, I got asked uh, by, by my agent, because you know what, we'd, we'd do a lot better if you had a book. And I was like, oh God, I knew it. Um, but I graduated in English from Louisiana State University, go Tigers, if there's any Tiger fans, or SEC fans, are there any SEC people here? Okay, good, we're all friends, SEC <laughs> people. Um, but I, I'd always written and stuff. I wrote a book at the end of the 90s uh, that I finished around 2001. I was having it uh, edited by a girl named Amanda Boyden, who is a, who's won a lot of awards for her fiction. It's very cool, hipster fiction. Uh, Pretty Dirty Things was one of her books. It may be for sale here. I um, mean, she was editing it, and then the movie The Hangover came out. And it was an, a lot better version of my story. My story, my, I swear to God, my story was bachelor party gone awry in Tampa. Tampa's a lot dirtier than the Ve Vegas, of none of the glamour at all. It's really dirty. And I even had a dentist character who was kind of, I swear to God, I was like, fuck. So that kind of put cold water on my writing dreams, even though I'd always dreamed about doing it. But. So that's where I was. But so when my agent said, hey, you should, you, should, you should write a book, I was like, done, I'll do it. The pandemic helped. That's why there's been an explosion of books. 
Um, I didn't want to write a memoir. There's so many great memoirs, so many great rock and roll memoirs. And, you know, look, after the Keith Richards memoir, after The Dirt by Motley Crue, what am I going to add to the pantheon of uh, decadent rock and roll memoirs? Um, so I realized I wanted to put um, the, these, these tools into a book. Um, and I didn't want it to be prosaic, like, do this. You know, this works for me. Uh, you know, I've always loved narratives. My, my favorite songs that, you know, that I grew up listening to, songs like Tangled Up in Blue, um, Dylan, well, all the Dylan songs, are all, they're all, they're all tell stories, they're all narratives. And like some of my favorite Better Than Ezra songs, Lifetime, they're all stories. And I was like, you know what, I'll do, I'll tell a story. And some of my favorite books that, like business books and, and self, uh, self-improvement self books, tell a story, they're business parables. It's books like Who Moved My Cheese, or Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or The Go-Giver. And I, I remember going and I was like, let me find my copy of, of Who Moved My Cheese. And I pulled up the book, and cover to cover, it was 49 pages. And on the back, it said 14.1 million copies sold. And then I just I reread it, and I was like, this is really terrible writing. I can do this. <laughs> I swear to God, I'm pulling back the curtain. This is the unvarnished truth. And so I was looking at these different books, and then The Go-Giver, which is, which is I really like this, the, 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 uh, the layout of the book. Again, it was not a very well-written book, and I was like, I'm an English major. I can write, I can write way better than that. And I started writing. Um, I came up with the character that Olivia spoke about, Jake Stark. And as I was writing it, it turned into kind of an exercise to get, it started as an exercise for me to, uh, to get more speaking gigs. I hope you're not second guessing as you're hearing me speak. Um, but then as it got going, I got, I got involved with the characters. Um, and then as I kept writing, I'm like, this has my name on it. It's got to be good. Just like when I write a song, it starts off as a silly idea, like, wah, wow, it was good. But then you're like, wait a second, I, this has got to be, this has got to be a great song. It's got to be a great recording because it's going to, it's, it's my name. And as I, I kept writing the book and, and I was, and I was like, this is really good. I'm on to something. I would tell my wife, you know, I'm going to write. I was that guy at, at the Starbucks or on the road at the coffee shop you see writing like, oh, who's, who's the middle-aged guy writing the screenplay? That was me. Um, but I kept writing, and I was using this great program called Scrivener. If you're anybody's a writer, you can use whatever. You can use a typewriter. Um, but I use Scrivener, and, and it ha what I love about it, I don't use any of the things it can do. I'm, I'm complete Luddite when it comes to this program. But it does have this thing, daily, uh, daily goals. It's a little pull-down menu, and it tells you how many words you wrote each day. So I started off like, you know, I'm going to write 500 words. And I'd go in and start having coffee. And a lot of the times, I'd look up and say 600 words, and I'd be done. Then other days, I was like, struggling to get 87 words. Some other days I'd, I'd look, it'd be, be 3,000 words. But over the course of four years, I wrote this book. I finished the book. Um, and there was something missing from it. Uh, and I realized that I'd kind of, I hadn't mentioned the Jake Stark, the main character's family. And it was really kind of an aha moment for me, like a slap in the face, like, wow. I need to add some heart to this book. And so I rewrote the book with Jake's wife and son. Because of what I realized for me in my, in my uh, journey to become a better uh, coworker, a better bandmate, a better husband, a better dad, was realizing that the things that I do um, that help me in business, collaborating, listening, Taking contrary action also helped me in my in my personal life, and when I did, and, and and that was like, oh my God, that's when the momentum of the book started happening. It was like, wait, there's all these things that are par they're all truths in business and life and family and love. I'm going to put that into the book, and that's what I put into the book. And uh, there was a lot of rewrites. I had some great help. Um, working on the book and I'm just so pleased that it's come out and people have reacted to it in a really positive way. And I also got to do, I hope this isn't verboten, um, I also love doing the audio book, which was, <laughs> which was a blast. I, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to listen to it. It was a real afterthought. I was in the studio writing with this amazing writer. Her name is Claire Garesso. 
She is known in the business as a sync writer. That's short for synchronization. So sync is S Y N C H. Um, so she gets songs. She she's like brilliant at writing a target jingle, or all this all the songs you hear that just make you want to you know it's a spring day you want to go shop I want to go buy toilet paper. <laughs> that song in the target ad is usually a Claire Garesso song. So I was writing one of those songs with her because they can be really lucrative. And I think, and, and there's a few, there's a few like hallmark words you need to write. Great day. These are words you can start with. Great day. Top of the world. It's going to be okay. If you put any of those songs in there and add a, that's what great, great day is, the song in the book. Um, but anyhow, Claire said, so you're going to do an audio book? And I was like, uh, yeah, I got it. My typical cocky self. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'll just figure it out because I was in my studio and I, I know how to record myself. And she was like, you know, you really should talk to my husband. And her husband is a guy named Mark Gallup, or he pronounces it Galoop. And he does all the audio books for Audible. And he did uh, Prince Harry's, uh, what, what is it? What's the name of it? Spare. Spare. Oh, you have read it. <laughs> Uh, spare, but he did the Kevin Hart book, and but I did this audio book, and I had such a blast doing it. I did all the voices, um, and I would be doing the different voices. There were several women. Uh, there's different uh, <laughs> different people from different parts of the world, and I ca I would be doing an accent, and then I would just lean over off of the mic, and I was like, "Am I going to get canceled for any? Am I just completely naive and blind that this is a really offensive?" impression I'm doing. He's like, no, it's great. So you tell me, you can check that out as well. Um, but before, before I do a q and let me t tell you just a little kind of what is the foundation, where the foundation for uh, one of the, the, the first practice in the method comes from, which is creative collaboration. Um, better than Ezra in 1995. I love coming to Washington, D.C. Because often in the speech I talk about, I start it by saying, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to suspend time right now. You're going to come with me. We're going to journey back to 1995. It's HF Festival, <laughs> RFK Stadium, Pearl Jam, PJ Harvey, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Hole are all playing HF Festival, but they don't have the number one song in the country. Better than Ezra has a number one song in the country, and then I'll I'll play I'll play good for you later. But then I'll play good. But so 1995, it was an amazing year. We uh, we 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 exploded after we were together. We'd been together seven years. Um, exploded on the scene. Uh, played all over the world. All the big TV shows: uh, Letterman, Leno, Conan O'Brien, the John Stewart show before he did uh, his shows. Um, I was on Politically Incorrect with Christopher Hinchins. You should watch that. I got into it. I almost came to fisticuffs with <laughs> the rest of soul. Um, but then in 1996, our second album came out, Friction Baby. Uh, the first one, Deluxe Soul, triple platinum. Friction Baby came out a year later, and it went gold, 500,000. 1997, our third album came out, uh, How Does Your Garden Grow, which is... It's a beautiful album. It's it's a lot of fans' favorite album. It's, uh, we we recorded it in Bearsville Studios up in, in Woodstock with with amazing string sections done. The string arrangements by Carl Berger, who did all the string arrangements for Jeff Buckley's uh, Grace album. It's a beautiful album, but it sold about 180,000 copies. Um, fast forward to 2002, we were working on our fourth um, album waiting for our label, Electra Records, to pick up the option for the fourth album when we got the call that most bands get, unless you're Chris Martin or, or Billy Joe Armstrong or name some massive, massive band, at some point you get a call that says you've been dropped. And we got that call in 2002. I was, we were in our studio. We were actually working on songs for the fourth album that would be closer. And I got a call from my manager, hey, Kevin, just spoke to Business Affairs, you've been dropped from Electra and it was a gut punch. I mean it was a it was it was just a blow. Um in seven short years we'd gone from almost being a household name. A lot of I mean look, Norm MacDonald used us in one of his most famous bits ever. It was nineteen ninety five on on a on a, a weekend update when he said 
The number one college, number one band on college campus this summer was better than Ezra. Number two, Ezra. <laughs> and when Norm passed away a couple years ago, they used that in a lot of the top ten bits. But, uh, but yeah, so we 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 got dropped, and uh, in seven short years, almost a household name, almost played Saturday Night Live. Um, and here I was, it was 2002. I was in a band that had been dropped that was big in the last century. Um, I was just turning 30, and I was like, what do I do? You know, do I, oh man, we're a drop band. Um, I thought my, my, my initial thing was like, well, so I'll, I'll go to law school, because I was gonna go to law school at, at some point. And that, that's, when after I graduated at LSU, I had at three years of my LSAT. So I, I would just keep reapplying, because you can't defer anymore. I just keep reapplying, reapplying. And then the three year the end came to LSAT, and I was in free fall. The safety net disappeared, and rock and roll had taken over. But that was a brief thought, you know, quit music. I was like, no, I love music, it's, it's my life. Ever since I f got my first albums, uh, the first five albums I ever got, that my father, who was not a music fan, bought. Somebody was gifted at the stereo store in Atlanta, Buckhead, Atlanta. The first five albums I got were Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, Elton John, Houses of the Holy, Led Zeppelin, Stevie Wonder Inner Visions, Grand Funk Railroad were an American band, and the Sly and the Family Stone album were Sly's in black leather on the white cover. Those are my first five albums, but ever since then, music had been my passion. And so I realized I was gonna stay in music, but something had to change. And this saying that my father would always tell me came into my head. It's just been this mantra, for better or for worse. He always says, Kevin, nothing changes if nothing changes. He also, he says two things. He's passed away. Another thing he said, Kevin, lazy man works twice as hard. <laughs> I used to hate that when I would do something half-ass. He goes, lazy man works twice as hard. I said, you have to do it again. Now I'm that. I say that to my, my kids. My four, they hate it as much as I do. But my dad, that, those, that voice in my head, uh, Kevin, nothing changes if nothing changes, came into my head. I was like, I've got to do something different. So I started looking at my peers who were kicking ass, who were, who were crushing it. And even then, Max Martin, the producer, um, was already well on his way to being the biggest producer in the world. He had already done Baby Hit Me One More Time, Britney Spears, all the NSYNC stuff. And he's still, to this day, the, the biggest. Um, he's working, you know, he works with... Uh, uh, the weekend and Molly Cyrus and you name it, he does it. But it, but also uh, Pharrell, who was with the Neptunes, um, and Chad Hugo, and I started at the same time studying different musicians and producers. Hey, what are they doing? Um, I also started looking at different business people. What are these different business people doing? Because I've always been interested in that. You know. What, what you'll find in the music business is the people who are the biggest in the music business are also really good businessmen. You know, Paul McCartney, uh, Justin Timberlake, Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus. They're uh, the pinnacle of brilliance and mu musicality, Taylor Swift. So they're really smart people. Um, so I was start and I started to see all these different parallels and like what my, these producers and musicians do and these business people do. And right about that time, somebody came into my life that would change the trajectory of my life. I'd had no idea at, at, at the moment. It was, it was 2003, Better Than Ezra. We were in Los Angeles. We were mixing the Closer album. We were uh, at a studio called Conway. Has anybody ever heard of Conway Studio? No? Well, I'm going to tell you about it. That is not one of the voices from... Uh, <laughs> that's just my old voice. He's a Southern general. Aloysius Dubois. <laughs> Usually when I talk about the 90s, it's always in a, always in a voice of a Civil War general. <laughs> it just feels right. Uh, we were making an album at Conway Studio. Now, Conway Studio in the music business is a famous place. It's right in the armpit of Hollywood at the corner of Melrose and St. Andrews. And it's, a lot, it's very gentrified now. But in, but in the 90s and in 2003, it was really sketchy. It's the corner that Perry Farrell sings about and Jane says, Jane says she woke up on St. Andrews. She gets a dinner there. Which is heroin, of course. That's what that corner was. But in one corner, the southwest corner, 
is this mass is this massive thirty foot wall. It's a terracotta wall and it's capped with Spanish tile. And you go around the corner to down St Andrews and you put in you push in your buttons. I can't remember if you press the button. And if you're if you're on the list, the doors part and suddenly you go from the grime of Hollywood into this this uh, Shangri-La, this cloistered area that is just mind blowing. It's flowing bougainvillea, uh, birds of paradise, manicured gardens, and and you pull your car in, and there's these three amazing recording studios back there. And in 2003, we were mixing our our closer album in Studio B, in Studio A, Justin Timberlake was making his first solo album, and nobody thought he was going to do anything. Everybody thought it was going to suck because he was in sync and no one, and you know, he wore that all denim acid wash outfit with Brady Spears. How can you have good taste if you, if you rock a, a, denim, a, a denim, an acid wash denim pantsuit at the Grammys? But we were wrong. In Studio C was the man who would change the director directory of my life. That man was rock and roll legend seller of 120 million records, star in Rocky Horror Picture Show, star, starring role in Fight Club. Of course, I speak of Meatloaf. Meatloaf was in Studio C. And we'd heard he was there, and we're like, oh, fucking Meatloaf is there. And he wasn't, and we thought we were so cool, and, and he wasn't that cool. He was, he was he, it wasn't the hottest moment in his career. Um, he had just recorded uh, Objects in the Mirror Are Closer Than they, they Appear, which is a Diane Warren song. It's actually pretty good. Um, he was in that studio, in Studio C, and one morning this guy came up to me. His name's Alan Kovac. He's a, he was, he's a short guy, kind of craggly guy, Alan Kovac. He, he came up to me and said, Kevin, Alan Kovac. Now, in the music business, people know who Alan Kovac is. They usually roll his eyes, but everybody knows who he is. At the time, he was the manager of Meatloaf, but he also managed the Bee Gees, managed Blondie. He still manages Motley Crue. He's a legend. And he came up to me and said, hey, uh, Alan Kovac, Kevin, um, listen, Meat heard one of your songs. It was Closer. It was the song Closer off the Closer album. Go figure. Um, he'd love to write a song with you. And I, I, had, I, I, I was blown away. Um, the, my first thought was like, there's no way I'm writing a song because I never collaborated. All the Better Than Ezra songs, those first three albums, were I'd written all those songs, and I and I just because I I never I never had done it, I didn't have anything against collaboration. Maybe I also like being the hundred percent owner of these songs as well. And and when you write something, when you create something yourself, it's already past that internal litmus test. You know, is it cool? Am I re am I repeating myself lyrically? Is it compelling? Whatever idea it is, so I I, I was initially hesitant. And, uh, and I told Alan, let me get back to you. And I was walking away from him. And those words my dad would always say to me came into my head, Kevin, nothing changes if nothing changes. And I wheeled around on my heels and I said, I said Alan, you know what? I'll do it. I'll write a song with him. Two hours later, I was about to go into the green room with meatloaf. And I expected, I swear to God, my mind, is, my, my imagination is super vivid. And I, and I thought it was just going to be like rolling fog dry ice fog on the floor and chiffon and lace and uh, you know and like like a high school production of a Phantom of the Opera <laughs> starring meatloaf but I went into that room and I waited for him and he came in he was just this cool dude he was from East Texas and he was such an awesome guy um, and I mean look I'm a massive fan of Bad Out of Hell two out of three ain't bad I love you I want you but there ain't no way I'm ever gonna love you now don't be sad Two out of three ain't bad. Can you imagine writing that lyric? <laughs> if we had more time, I would regale you with an acapella version of Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Oh, I, you think I'm lying. I, I did it. I did it at the Stone Pony in, uh, in Asbury Park, New Jersey. But he came in, and he was really into this song by North Mississippi All-Stars, which uh, is this amazing three-piece uh, Jim, uh, Jim Dickinson's son is the guitarist in the band. And uh, and it was just kind of cut time song. Went boom, tuk, boom, boom, tuk, boom, boom, and I was like, he goes, I want to do a song like this. So I got my guitar out. Two hours later, 
we had written this seven minute opus uh called testify about a truck driver addicted to speed and his truck breaks down on the texas highway and he stumbles into a tent side revival and he's saved it's called testify and it has a gospel choir and if you want to see an exercise in bad taste after after the night when you got back home and you're all snuggly google meatloaf testify boys choir sydney stadium and hit return and then sit back for an exercise in bad taste <laughs> But the song, the song blew up outside the United States. I, like earlier, I said that you know Meatloaf wasn't at the hottest point of his career. Outside of America, he was on fire. Then I wrote for another Alan Kovac artist, Blondie. I wrote a song called "Good Boys," and it was a really cool song. I totally, I was like, you need to do "Heart of Glass 2.0." I didn't tell her that. You never tell the, tell the artist what you're thinking. <laughs> there's all these, there's all these Jedi mind tricks. It's great, and you can use these Jedi mind tricks when you're working with someone. If you, like, you, you come up with an idea, they go, oh, that's a cool idea. I go, no, that was your idea. You said that earlier. And they go, oh, I did. Or if you're trying to get your idea across, just say, just say I don't know, it just feels more honest. Everybody loves that. <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't tell, I didn't tell Blondie uh, that, that I was ripping off a Heart of Glass. But, but Good Boys came out and did really well. I wrote with Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees. It was a terrible song. We were too stoned to write a good song because we were working at his house in, uh, in Miami and he had this massive walk-in uh, marijuana humidor. Uh, that was before I was sober. Um, and, uh, but, but in short order, collaboration suddenly exploded in my life. It became the bedrock of everything I do in my life and from, every, from collaboration, Everything else, my happiness, is, uh, my success has sprung from that. And there's a reason why that's the first uh, practice in the method. And so to learn the rest of it, you gotta, you got to read the book. Um, why don't I, well, you know what? I think Nicole wisely suggested, why don't, I, why don't I play some songs? Let me play a few songs. I'll, do some, do, I'll take some requests. Then we'll do a, a, a question and answer. And then I'll sign some books. So let me uh, let me grab my my get fiddle as a buddy calls it. Hold on, I'm gonna go off mic. Can you still hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The elephant in the room is that I know that Stormy Daniels did the book signing thing. <laughs> because this is such a classy joint. <laughs> but probably the biggest book signing ever was Stormy Daniels. It was. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, you know what? Why don't I just, why don't I just do that? Yeah, let me see. Let's, well, let's do this. I'm a pro. Oh, I love them. <laughs> I don't know if you'll, maybe for online, you, this will help, right? Yeah. Hello. Uh, you guys got any, I figured at first I wasn't going to do any songs when I said I'm going to do a book tour. Then I was like, no one's going to come unless I say I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do some. That's just my insecurity being a musician. Um, request, song request. Ooh. Ooh. You know what? I want to do that song, but let me do a couple songs before because it's kind of high. Because I capo, let me do. Give me. Can you go everything in two? What? What? I don't know it. What? What? Palace Hotel. Palace Hotel. Keep going. All right, I'll do circle. But let, that, that's good because it's from the first cassette. But I will do at the stars. I swear to God. This was from Better Than Ezra's first release. It was the cassette. It came out in 1989, and then it was later on the Empire Records soundtrack with Liv Tyler. Well, well, how the times have changed. Looking back, it seems so clear now. Everything you wanted in your life 
Everything is certain Try and understand Put a checklist on your wall I am not what you think I should be Now you're making a mess Through your circle of friends And you're trying to fit me to their mold Now you're making amends To your circle of friends And you're trying to fit me to their mold Here comes the rock, the soft rock little taste of it. All right. Let me do, uh, I'll just do uh, Reader's Digest abridged versions. There's a good reference. I'll, I'll do a little bit of that. Do you ever play uh, I'll Be Your Man by the one you wrote for Oh, I should. I mean, I'll try to play a little bit. Uh, at the Stars. Maybe I, well, sorry? A song that was collaboration. Yes, I will. Very well. Yeah, thank you very much. Who is she? <laughs> Get her out of here. <laughs> yes, I will. Uh, Maybe I should drop. <laughs> Who is she's here again? My nemesis. <laughs> Maybe I should drop you at your door. Go ahead. I'll leave tonight and vanish up the shore. Anywhere but here. It's three o'clock, we're driving in your car. You're screaming out the window at the stars. Don't drive me home, yeah. Plain is cause we are who we are. Hate is cause you'll never get that far. Then who supposed you would go? I've already learned enough to know it didn't. Collaborative moment. See, I'm going to start adding that in all the time because I should. It makes sense. Um, so I had this title, 2006. I had this song title. I knew it was a, was a money title. Um, songs come from all different ways places. Sometimes it's like uh, I'll Be Your Man, the James Blunt song. Other times it's a beat. Other times it's a title. For, and, and this I had this title I knew was could be a big single. And I, it was Collide. I had this word, Collide. I was like, and at the time there had been no hit songs written called Collide. And I, and I tried, I tried a, as, a, as a rock song. It sucked. Um, and different ideas. Then I heard Bruce Springsteen's song, Secret Garden. And it had kind of this great descending chord progress. It's not this, but this is Collide. It kind of went like this, with this high G. Kind of sustaining thing. I was like, oh my God, that's the, that's the DNA. That's the vibe of Collide. Whatever Collide is gonna be. You can almost hear Bruce Springsteen. She'll let you in your <laughs> It let you in your heart. He was sitting at politics and pro. Far from the garage where his old man said he needed a word. <laughs> we'll just write Springsteen song. But I had the title, and, and, I, and then I came up with the chorus for Collide. Uh, Even the best fall down sometimes. Even the wrong words seem to run. And that's all I had. A couple weeks later, uh, I had this kid come to my studio 
in New Orleans. This was right before Katrina, so this was 2005. Um, I had this amazing studio right in the Lower Garden District of New Orleans on Terpsichore, named after one of the muses. Um, maybe it's Terpsichore, I'm not sure. Um, and this kid was from Bangor, Maine. He was 18 years old at the time, Howie Day. And we were writing songs. I wrote a lot of songs with him. And then I played him Collide. And he was like, that's my crash. That's my Dave Matthews crash song. And we wrote the verse together. And I, I, I couldn't come I just had this mental block with the song because I'd struggled with it so long. So I was like, I'm going to collaborate. And that's why this song, we, we were able to finish it. And, and how we brought something to it that I couldn't. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was a tough, once the song was finished, it was, uh, this is a question I get asked a lot. Are there certain songs you write that you want your own band to put out versus the other artists? And sometimes you have to make a practical decision about what's the best vehicle to get the song heard. Um, ballads or mid-tempo songs are the hardest songs to permeate the consciousness of music listeners because they just take repeated listenings they're, listenings, they're not you know, instantly fun and, and bouncy, so the label really has to believe in it. Better Than Ezra, we, were, we, had, we had been on Elektra Records, the label, uh, we ended up signing a record deal with that guy, Alan Kovac. It went bankrupt, and he never paid me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so I realized, I was like, Better Than Ezra's not with a strong enough label to launch this song, but Howie Day is, he was 18, he was the hot artist on Epic Records. But we wrote that song. I'll play a little verse in a in chorus for you. The dawn is breaking. A light shining through. You're barely waking. And I'm tangled up in you. Even the best fall down sometimes Even the stars refuse to shine And out of the doubt that fills your mind You somehow find You and I collide da 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 da, da. Finally find you and I collide. Let's do two more. We'll do two more songs. Thank you so much. The what? Keep running. Keep running. I don't know it yet, uh, but it's one of my favorite songs from it. This time of year. This time of year. Ooh, very well. Good job. <laughs> this one was written. Um, our van broke down on the way to play the uh, a party in Oxford, Mississippi, home of John Grisham, but more importantly, William Faulkner. You can go to Roanoke when you go to uh, when you go to Oxford, Mississippi. One of my favorite bookstores, Square Books, it's super dope. Second only to Politics and Prose. <laughs> But we broke down at a rest area, and it was uh, it was the LSU Oxford uh, Ole Miss football game was that weekend, and the first cool breeze of fall was coming in, and it inspired the song. Well, there's a feeling in the air, just like a Friday afternoon. Yeah, you can go there if you want. Though it fades too soon So go on with yourself If there's a feeling coming somewhere else Seems like it's always understood This time of year Well, I know there's a reason to change well, I know there's a time for us You think about the good times And you live with all the bad You can feel it in the air Yeah, I can feel it in the air Yeah, I can feel it in the air Feeling right 
right this time of the year. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'll end, I'll end with a song about a collaboration, but it also has something to do with the book. One of the things that I talk about in the book is uh, changing your attitude. And uh, in, there's a chapter in the book where Jake learns about changing your attitude. He goes up in a Cessna 150, which is a, 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 a single prop Cessna plane, which has the dubious distinction of having the most uh, plane crashes and deaths of any plane. But it's also, I guess, there's more of them than any other airplane. But he goes up in this plane with a guy named Shane Sawyer, who in the audio book, he talks like Sam Elliott. What's up, dude? And, uh, you got you got to get the audio book for that. Sorry, uh, but he learns about and, and now changing your attitude isn't like what your your mom or your dad or your coach would tell you. You need to change your attitude. It's attitude as it's used in aviation. Um, like altitude is your height above the ground, but attitude is your orientation to the ground. Uh, we are you nose down, nose up, yawn to the left, to the right. But specifically, it's your angle of approach when you're. song, um, I'll start playing something. That's my angle of approach to land it, to, to finish the song. But sometimes it doesn't work. So you got to change your angle of approach. In my songwriting world, I'll go to a lyric, collide, you know, or we'll start talking about somebody will have, if I'm in a songwriting session with you guys, you'll say, I got, you guys got anything? You're like, well, I got this idea. And the, the, the other night I was doing a Sunday and they said, God's Guest List. That's a great country song title. God's <laughs> Guest List. Uh, um, but so, so just in talking about it, suddenly, okay, that you, a song has started. Or you'll come up with a beat. Like, you, like in, in the studio, I have a computer and we're like, okay, this isn't working. God's Guest List or whatever song title or lyric idea we had isn't working. Let's, let's just build a beat. That will inspire the song. And usually... By just talking about it, a beat, a guitar thing, suddenly by changing my approach, changing my attitude, suddenly a song was born. Another good tool is taking a great song or a great idea, whatever it is in your business that you love. It's a great idea that you're like, God damn, that's good. You know, reverse engineer it. Like all the time, a songwriting session, we'll just listen to a song we're loving. I remember as it was, Harry Styles, we were all like, what are the chords? It's this. It's, this. it's the same chords as take on me so changing your attitude changing your angle of approach when you're at a creative deadlock a great example of that I was uh, I was in LA 2012 um, I'm still living in Silver Lake I had this really cool studio in Atwater Village which is right across the Hyperion Bridge in LA I was riding with this guy named Shy Carter who had had it only, his only success was he was the assistant engineer on the Nelly album, Country Grammar, which is a classic album. But we were writing a song, and, and we started the session. Another way to change your, to, uh, change your angle of approach, you just, just get inspired by what's happening on the radio. Um, and we were like, well, what's happening on the radio right now? At the time, Hey Soul Sister was really big, and Jason Mraz, I'm Yours, was really big. So I started doing a esque type song, so like that. So that felt close enough to something like that. Two hours later, I was still doing that. We had nothing. <laughs> um, so we took a break. We went to Intelligentsia, this super highbrow coffee joint in LA. They're all over. You can also get their coffee <laughs> elsewhere. Um, we came back, and I went in the studio, and Shy was like, yo, Kevin, I'm going to go get some herbal inspiration. <laughs> And I was like, oh, and he went to go get stoned. Um, it was legal at the time, it still is. Um, so he went in and uh, he went outside to get elevated. And, uh, and I put auto-tune on his vocal track. I was like, okay, we haven't been able to get anything. I need to change the approach on us writing this song. So auto-tune, you've heard of it before, but it's really, it's a program. Uh, we call them plugins in the music world, but it's just like an app. 
And if you put it on a vocal track and you put in the key of the song, in this instance, the key of G, anything you sing through that program will be a third or a fifth or the main melody in the key of G. So all the time in pop music, people start off with no idea at all and they just start fishing around because anything you do, you'll just be talking like this. But then through autotune, it's like, you just be talking like this. <laughs> you know, and you've heard, you've seen memes, you know, where somebody recounting some type of, they've been robbed, like, I was robbed. <laughs> they broke into my, I mean, like, that's, that's a dope. So I started doing this again and I knew I needed to be ready because when you work with someone who smokes weed, there's a beautiful but very small window of brilliance. <laughs> it's just like, it's like magic. It's like, it's like ambrosia coming from the heavens, but you gotta be ready to capture it. So I had the, the, had the, the, the vocal channel armed, ready to record. I had auto-tune on and Shy came in and he, and he started singing this. And I was like, oh my God, I hit record. And I was like, that is a hit melody. And 30 minutes later, we had this song, a verse and a chorus. And I, I was like, this sounds like a, a Sugarland song to me. And our old drummer, Travis, was playing with Sugarland. And I'd gotten to know Jennifer Nettles and Christian Bush. And I, I texted Christian. I was like, do you guys, are you guys finished with your album? And he was like, no, this was a Thursday. This never happens, by the way, in the business. This was a Thursday. He goes, we're going to the studio on Tuesday. We need a single. And I was like, I've got your hit single. Mm -hmm. I sent it to him. Two hours later, Jennifer, Jennifer and Christian uh, did a three-way call with me, and, and they had already written a second verse. This song was recorded. This is still the 11th highest streamed song in country music history, and it all started because collaboration and changing your attitude and then shy getting stoned. <laughs> Absolutely no one knows me better. No one that can make me feel so good. How did we stay so long together when everybody, everybody said we never would. Just when I start to think they're right. The love is died. There you go, making my heart beat again, heart beat again, heart beat again. There you go, making me feel like a kid. Won't you do it, do it one time? There you go, pulling me right back in, right back in, right back in, and I know I'm never letting this go. Oh oh, uh, I'm stuck on you. Oh 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 oh, stuck like glue. You and me, baby, we're stuck like glue. Uh. Oh, 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 stuck like glue. You and me, baby, we're stuck like glue. Uh, come, dee, dee, come, dum, da, dum, dum. KG singing at dum, da, dum. Politics in pro, Storm of Daniels got nothing on this night, night, night. There you go, making my heart beat again. Heart beat again. Heart beat again. It back, I'm back. How long did it take you from start to finish to write the book? And how did you keep going when you hit a hiccup or a, uh, it just didn't seem to be working the way you wanted it to? That is a great question. I think the book, um, what's your name? Robin. Robin, I'm Kevin. Um, <laughs> it took me about four years, I think, you know? Um, and it was, Wondering, making sure I can settle this. Uh, I, I, I'm really fortunate because uh, being a songwriter, and, I, and I've learned over the years that uh, a, 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 some, an idea I have in my head, if I just don't quit on it, that it will go from being a, 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 some silly idea like wah ah, it was good, to a song to a song my band likes, to a recording, 
to a release, to a hit, to something that will be a career for me, to something that other people have in their life, a video, and, and can change things. So I, I've, I have the unfair distinction of being a songwriter and knowing that if I had an idea, that if I just don't stop on it, that I know that it can reach its fruition and reach people. So that was always like, you know, you know, just don't quit. So my biggest thing was that program, uh, Scrivener, which is a great program and that those daily goals. So I would, I started off pretty modest. I was like, I just, you just got to write 500 words. 500 words really isn't that much, you know? And, and I believe in when I write, I just spit it out. I worry, I worry about editing the next morning. I come and I edit for the first 10 minutes. I just look over and I'm like, oh my God, that's terrible. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, and uh, so I would do it. I would, I would just, I'd be like, I'd be typing, I'd be working 275, uh, you know, 400 words. More times than not, when I would check that little pull down menu, it would say 3,000 words. And then I'd be done. Or sometimes I struggled. You know, a lot of times I was like, I just got to write 250 words. It kept, kept going lower and lower. A lot of times I was super diligent. I would go two, three months every day on the road. And I got into this, I got into a habit of it. And then just like songwriting, anything you do, it's a muscle. When you exercise it, if I'm not writing, if I'm on the road and I'm not writing regularly, when I go into a songwriting session, I just suck for the first week. You know, and so with, with uh, the book, when I was at my best was when I was doing it every day. But then I would go, there'd be times I'd go three or four months and I'd be like, you got to finish the book. You've got to start working. Then I would, then I'd have to spend all that time re reading. I'd have to reread it and see where I was going, you know, and to, to know. Um, but it was really, you know, my career, my life is, is an example of not quitting. Um, nothing ever, was easy with Better Than Ezra. We got together in the spring of 1988. We were passed over by everybody for years, for seven years. I wrote good in 1990. It was it was turned down by every label. We did all these um, showcases in front of managers and labels and publishers where they just had their arms crossed, like some of you do right now, and they would just walk out. So I just knew. I, so so that was. My, you know, again, it goes back to being, mu you know, to to having success in music and, and learning the hard way. It's just like, don't quit. Because I knew I wasn't the best writer. I knew I wasn't the smartest. But I just, like, in my career, I, you know, there's, it's not the person who's the fastest or the smartest or the most talented. It's the person that doesn't quit. You know, that's where the rubber hits the road. Who is going to be around when the dust settles? You know, and it's so, it's so many times that served me well. So I just knew, don't quit. Get off your ass, you know, you know my dad's voice <laughs> in my head. Um, and that's really served me well. But then, then when I got the idea, when I, came, when I knew I needed to put heart into it with, uh, with uh, Jake's uh, wife and son, that was a big moment. And then when I could see, when I could really see... Um, the final chapters. I just knew, and that really kind of drove me. You know, I, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Great. Thank you so much, Robin. Next, well done. I'll try to make it a quick two-parter, yeah. but uh, how do you approach in songwriting um, your past work versus your future work? For example, um, like in a song, a lifetime. There's a there's a piece that kind of reminds me of Good. Oh yeah. Because you sing the same song or the same word. How do you approach it? Does it change the way you? formulate songs you try not to reuse stuff or, or you know what's your approach on that and then secondly uh, how do you feel when people like taylor swift say that uh, better than ezra is one of their favorite bands and inspiring these other people who are you know minus better than ezra taylor swift's probably yeah. the top of the world right now uh, but you know how does that make you feel oh uh, well um with uh with your first question i think that um you're always when you're when you're writing when you're writing your own songs when you're you're um, you have that you're always wanting to second guess yourself and you have to you have to impress yourself and that's kind of one of the one of the great freeing things about collaboration because for so many of those early better than Ezra songs it was just me so I you know I'm always asking myself have I written about this before are these are these chords is this chord progression the same is this cool um, is this going someplace um, new that's challenging me that's you know that's exciting at the same time there's the voice in my head that says the greatest songwriter in the world that you which who's my favorite 
writer ever, Tom Petty, also knew the brilliance of keeping it simple. You know, so you, 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 you walk this line of wanting to impress yourself, be cool in your mind, second guessing yourself, and, uh, and trying to do different chord progressions you've never done, at the same time saying, Everybody loves the song good, and your, your silliest songs, your easiest songs, you know, are the ones people like the most. So it's always this kind of balance, and what is, what, what the, the uh, remedy to that has been collaborations. Because when I collaborate with people, I'm not, I'm, I'm not second guessing myself. I'm just serving the song, and I talk about that in the book. Um, and that's really what's freed me up, uh, is working with different people. Um, but then also, you just don't want to repeat yourself. There's there's certain songs, there's certain like on um, all together now that album. I think oh, there's a word, a phrase I use twice, and it just bugs the crap out of me that I was lazy, you know, um, and you know just and, and not being lazy. Um, the Taylor Swift thing, it's just inc I'm incredibly grateful. It's so flattering to have the biggest artist in the world be a big fan. Taylor, um, if you don't know, she started in around 2007 covering Better Than Ezra, a song called Breathless, um, another one called Our Last Night, and we've been friends. Um, I've tried to use that friendship to get a songwriting session with her, but it hasn't worked. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when you have someone who's really successful like that, you gotta be careful, you wanna be careful, you know, you never want to act like you're, you know, taking advantage, but she's just so massively cool and great, and she's just an example of a, uh, I mean, she just really doesn't stumble as far as her decision making and her songwriting. Um, she's definitely uh, on the Valhalla of songwriters. So when other songwriters are fans and and uh, and cover your song, that's the biggest gift, you know, for sure. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Yes, big Sarah. fan. So oh, super yay, exciting. Thank you. Um, so I'm not an artist, but I am a creative, passionate person with like too many ideas. Um, and I, I pride myself on being a good collaborator, mm -hmm. but there are points that, you know, I believe questioning something makes us stronger, but there are points that questioning or changing or, or reframing things kind of loses the heart of the idea. And so how do you handle a situation where something that you've adjusted the altitude on kind of loses your heart? What do you do in that situation, or can you talk about it? What, what do you mean, like second like, guessing? Well, like, you know, I work for the government, so I'm like within boundaries and bureaucracy. You'd be surprised, but creativity can thrive there. Actually, oh. it's where it comes into play. So, how do you work within those confines where you have this idea, but it's kind of getting knocked down and uh, you're losing the heart? Um, well, first off, I, I, I start with a correction. You are an artist. You know, like I, like I started with, we're all born artists. You know, uh, even. It, it, People always think, they'll say, I hear, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm just not creative like you. I'm like, that's bullshit. You know, people think you have to be a painter or a songwriter to be considered an artist. You could do, you could be, uh, like I said, a baker or a plumber. You could work in, in government, you know, coming up with a business plan, a way of approaching something that hasn't been done. You're creating something and that demands creativity. And I really do think everybody is, I think we're all artistic animals, you know. Um, I think that um, something I talk about is um, is daring to be stupid, and there's uh, and that comes from uh, this quote that I love by this great educator named Sir Kenneth Robinson. He passed away, and that's maybe where I got Sir uh, Sir Daniel Smith Daniels, uh, the character in the book, the 28 year old enigmatic genius, and it's a, it's, it's a it's a nudge and a wink of the eye uh, to Spinal Tap as well. But um, the Sir Kenneth Robinson quote, and you can see it uh, if you go online and to a, his famous TED Talk, it has like the most views ever. Um, he says, you'll never come up with anything truly groundbreaking unless you're prepared to fail. So, so that, that idea is that when you're working, uh, when I'm writing a song or whatever it is you do, you need to create, if, if you create an environment in your workspace where big ideas are encouraged and failure isn't stigmatized and everyone feels the freedom to just come up with great ideas. Have you ever been in a situation, maybe you're intimidated, you're with your boss, or so me, it was when I was working with Max Martin, the biggest songwriter ever. You know, you always want to say, this, I know this probably sounds stupid, but you, you, you preface it with that, trying to lower the bar. That, that just means you're, you're second guessing yourself, you're worried about what other people are gonna think. The best songwriting sessions, the best songwriters are ones who um, 
don't have that at all. They have no filter. They just throw great ideas out. And a guy named JT Harding is an example of that. So um, I would say, and I hope I'm answering this right, and, and, and let me know because I can see your Keeping the win. heart. Yes. Yeah, so, so keeping the heart, keeping the heart, the, the, the wooden stake of creativity is cynicism getting jaded. Um, what I've found is, and, and I'm an eternal optimist, um, when an idea that I know is great, a song idea, doesn't, doesn't become a single or it falls on its face, a lot of times people like will go, oh man, you gotta be so bummed out, I love that song, it should have been as big as your old stuff. I'm like, it's a great song. It finds the great ideas, the heart, those ideas find a way of bubbling up. Breathless, the song that Taylor Swift made famous, was the 12th track on her album, wasn't released as a single. And at time and time again, when I think that there isn't any heart in the music business or other ideas, I'm always surprised and heartened because in the end, authenticity and heart wins out. So what I would say to you, dust yourself off. I'm constantly just getting back up, writing another song. And and because I don't, it, it comes back to not quitting. You just gotta keep going, you gotta keep going. And, and put the ideas with heart out there. Some of them get rejected, some of them get stepped on. But if you don't stop, you know, if you don't quit, at the end of the day, you, get, you don't get one, you get several times to get your foot in the door. And that heart and that idea and that song and that game chain, the paradigm shifting idea takes root and it takes over, yeah. Thank you so much, this yeah. is a real treat. Oh, thank you. So we got, yeah, we got one more. Is that Olivia? Yeah. Well, this is going to be the last This question. will have to be our last question. I hope it's good. I hope everybody likes it. You will. Okay, great. Uh, What's your hello, name? Hello, Mr. Griffin. I'm Peter. Peter. Um, Kevin. Uh, and you sort of touched on what I was going to ask about, but the, the step that resonated most with me, mainly because my parents and my bosses at the government um, all say I'm very good at it, is the daring to be stupid. Yeah. Um, or, 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 and, or as my friend <laughs> Sam Hunter says, dare to suck. Yeah. And I was just kind of wondering, like, professionally, an example from, uh, I guess, your experience in your life, what, what has been the best example of daring to be stupid and being stupid and having it blow up in the most fantastic way, in, in a good way? Like, Well, the song, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, really, so... so uh, good start. That song started off as an exercise. I was a big Pixies fan, you know. Um, the band that influenced Nirvana um, and Kurt Cobain would always say that they definitely influenced me and they were always about just f four chords you know and it was all about the only thing that, that dictated the dynamics the changes from verse to pre-chorus to chorus to bridge were just hitting a distortion pedal their their documentary is called loud quiet loud you know so I was really trying to write a song like that and Dylan always wrote four chord songs I wrote that song in Baton Rouge, and then we had a show that night at W.C. Don's in Jackson, Mississippi. W.C. Don's is uh, artists who toured around the South who are roughly my age. When you say W.C. Don's, they go, oh my God, W.C. Don's. It was a double wide trailer with like a one inch gap that went between the, the two p pieces. And, it was, and it, was a, it was a bar in Jackson, Mississippi. It was the indie rock bar. And it was run by um, uh, people in a, uh, a halfway house, um, and so they were interesting characters. Um, but we, but at soundcheck, we played good for the first time. I didn't have any lyrics for the chorus, so I was just going wah ah. But people react that night. Maybe it was the the uh, the members of the halfway house who were <laughs> they responded to wah ah, and uh, so that was an example of like of like that's so stupid it could be huge, you know, and then. You know, it, if you look, oh, listen to the crickets going. <laughs> That's my cue. But if, but, but also, by I'm not by accident or design. I'm not sure which. A lot of my hit songs, a lot of songs I have have a stupid little kind of whoa, oh, 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 stuck like glue. You and me, you know. And so I love that stuff. And in my, uh, you know, speaking of, you know, dare to be silly, dare to be stupid. My, one of my biggest tests if a song is a hit or not is if you play it for a toddler, if they <laughs> dig it, if they start going like, <laughs> you know you've got a hit song, you know, and stuck like glue, my, my kids were like, you know, three years old. Um, but I, I think, you know, just 
just again going back to Tom Petty at the height of his career, a rock and roll icon, he would just do just silly songs, and that's always been my mantra, you know. Uh, and then the biggest songwriters I know dare to be stupid all the time. You know, it's just like just lose the filter, put yourself out there, and and you, you get rewarded. Awesome, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna sign some books, guys. Thank y'all so much for allowing me in this highbrow.